I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. Welcome to this podcast of The People's Pharmacy. You can find previous podcasts and more information on a range of health topics at peoplespharmacy.com. You've heard about the microbiome, the microbes that live in our GI tract. What about the microbes that live on our skin? This is The People's Pharmacy with Terry and Joe Graydon. Ecologist Rob Dunn studies the teensy creatures that live on us. He'll help us unravel the mystery of face mites. We'll also learn about the bacteria that thrive in our armpits and belly buttons. In the larger world, taking out one species has a ripple effect on the whole ecosystem. Could the same be true for our skin? What's the relationship between diet and acne? Coming up on The People's Pharmacy... The fascinating world of tiny animals that inhabit us. In the People's Pharmacy Health Headlines, the United States Preventive Services Task Force, or USPSTF, has just proposed new guidelines that would change the timeline for mammograms. In 2009, the USPSTF recommended that women at average risk for breast cancer start getting regular screening mammograms at age 50. This week, it dropped the starting age from 50 to 40. The group recommends that women get screening mammograms every two years. This change seems to be prompted by rising breast cancer rates among younger women, especially among black women. They're 40 percent more likely to die of breast cancer than white women. Hopefully, earlier screening will detect tumors earlier so that they can be treated effectively. The USPSTF warns that people at higher risk for breast cancer should ask their personal physicians for advice on when to start screening and how often to do so. If a woman finds a lump in her breast, she should ask for a mammogram regardless of her age. That's not considered a screening mammogram, but is part of a diagnostic procedure. A recent report in the New England Journal of Medicine described 15-year outcomes after a diagnosis of prostate cancer. The researchers compared surgery to radiation or active monitoring. There were just over 500 men in each group. After 15 years, 45 men had died from prostate cancer, 3.1% of those in the active monitoring group, 2.2% in the prostatectomy group, and 2.9% in the radiotherapy cohort. There were more metastases in the active monitoring group, 9.4% versus 5% in each of the other groups. But at the end of the trial, the investigators concluded that prostate cancer specific mortality was low, regardless of the treatment assigned. Flu season for humans is finished for this year, but veterinarians are concerned about canine influenza. Cases are showing up in a number of states. Dogs can spread the virus between each other with close contact. In areas where dog flu is common, owners are being advised to restrict visits to dog parks and daycare centers to reduce the chances for transmission. There are vaccines for canine influenza. If a dog starts to cough, run a fever, or lose its appetite, owners should check in with the veterinarian. There's no indication that canine influenza can be transmitted to humans. In addition to lowering cholesterol, statin drugs are thought to have important anti-inflammatory effects. Consequently, scientists in Taiwan have analyzed data from the National Health Insurance Research Database and the National Cancer Registry to see if women who take statins are less likely to die of breast cancer. There were nearly 15,000 women in the study, evenly divided between those taking statins and those not on statins. Those on statins were significantly less likely to die from breast cancer. Somewhat surprisingly, the risk of cardiovascular death did not differ between the two groups. Recently, there's been a great deal of excitement about prescription drugs to promote weight loss. An umbrella review of 50 randomized controlled trials considered whether curcumin, an active ingredient in the yellow spice turmeric, can help people lose weight. Among the studies in the analysis, there were three types of formulations, turmeric, curcumin extract, or bioavailability-enhanced formulas. 
Participants in the trials ended with lower body mass indices if they took curcumin. That was most notable among those who were overweight to begin with. Waist circumference was also reduced. The authors point out that obesity is a complex problem, and simply taking curcumin pills doesn't solve it. Bioavailability-enhanced formulations were most effective, however, especially when combined with lifestyle changes. One of the most difficult and serious intestinal infections is caused by C. diff. This bacterium is hard to eradicate even with strong antibiotics. It can cause devastating diarrhea, cramping, and dehydration, among other problems. The FDA has just granted fast-track status to a unique cocktail of non-toxic bacteria. A randomized controlled trial published in JAMA concluded that VE303 prevented C. diff recurrences better than placebo. And that's the health news from the People's Pharmacy this week. Welcome to the People's Pharmacy. I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. Ecology is the study of how organisms relate to each other and to their environment. This might bring to mind grasslands and bison or woodlands and deer. Today, though, we're going to get a lot more personal. We're going to explore the ecology of our bodies, especially our skin. It turns out that our skin harbors a multitude of diverse creatures. What are they doing there? And how does that affect our health? To find out, we are going to turn to Dr. Rob Dunn. He's an ecologist and evolutionary biologist focusing on the biodiversity of humans. He's the William Neal Reynolds Distinguished Professor in the Department of Applied Ecology at North Carolina State University and in the Center for Evolutionary Hologenomics at the University of Copenhagen. Rob Dunn is the author of several books, including his latest, Delicious, The Evolution of Flavor and How It Made Us Human, co-authored with Monica Sanchez, and A Natural History of the Future, What the Laws of Biology Tell Us. Welcome back to The People's Pharmacy, Dr. Rob Dunn. Oh, it's it's great to be back on the show. Thanks for having me. Dr. Dunn, yeah, you're you're an, an ecologist and an evolutionary biologist, and you've spent a lot of time studying so many different aspects of our most familiar ecological systems, ourselves and our homes. Now, a lot of these participants are super tiny. We can't even see them. So let's start with one that most of our listeners have probably never heard about, face mites, demodex. What are they? Where do they live? How do they affect us? Well, those, those, are, those are big questions. I'll have to unpack them slowly. So the first, what, what are they? So they're mites, they're, they're kin to spiders, um, they're animals, and, and they're microscopic, and they live all over the human body. We tend to call them face mites because I think we're more comfortable thinking they're just, I don't know why we call them face mites, but um, they actually, they live on your back, they live on your legs, anywhere you've got hair follicles. So really they're skin mites. Really they're skin mites, they're body mites. And in others, and as far as we know, most mammals seem to have their own species of, of body mites. And in different uh, mammals, they live in different places. And so some mouse species seem to have a different species of mite that lives in their face relative to their back, relative to their belly. And so they can kind of divide divide us up to differing extents depending on, on who the host is. I think a lot of people would be somewhat freaked out to realize that there are many spiders all over their bodies. And, and how many are we talking about? Not a dozen, not a hundred, but what, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions? Uh, certainly thousands, probably in, in some cases hundreds of, of thousands. It's As you might imagine, it's difficult to do a, fu- a full survey. Um, but there are many, many, many of, the, of these mites sort of moving in and out of your, your follicles. And for reasons having to do with the silos of academia, they, they've really not been studied very much. And so in the 1950s and 60s, there were a couple of researchers that dedicated their lives to these mites. But there are so many species of these mites that 
that really there was too much for them to study on their own. And so most of what we might know about these mites is unknown. And, and I think the reason is um, medical researchers don't study them because except in unusual context, they don't seem to be medically problematic. And ecologists and evolutionary biologists don't tend to study them because we were all trained to go to faraway places and study those faraway places. And so they sort of fall in between fields and, and have been neglected for that reason. And so as a result, we don't really understand very well what they eat. Um, you know, we know that they mate somewhere. It's hypothesized that they crawl out and, you know, mate on the, on the surface and then crawl back in. And even really basic things can surprise us. And just just two examples here. One is that um, most humans seem to have two species of these mites. And if you were to look at them under the microscope, they look very, very similar. One is sort of this long Don Don Quixote sort of mite. And then the other one's a sort of chubbier Sancho Panza mite. But superficially, otherwise, they're kind of the same mite. And so for Initially, when people discovered them, they thought they were the same species and that, you know, maybe just depending on their diet or how old they were, they were different sizes. And then it was realized probably, oh, yes, they're, they're different species, but probably they're each other's closest relatives. Like, you know, they're like humans and Neanderthals. But recently, people have been able to look at the genetics of those two mites. Michael Polipoli, um, researcher, did this work and found that those two mite species diverged from each other 130 million years ago. Oh, my goodness. And so they're really not rela- like. related at all, but they just live <laughs> in a similar habitat. And, and so they've evolved similar adaptations for that habitat. And, and so that's a recent discovery. And so it gives you an in- inclination of how early our understanding is. And as for this this question of how we should feel about them, I, I do acknowledge that I can see when I when I talk about these mites to an audience, like the, the whole audience starts to wiggle around a little bit in an uncomfortable way, which is a speaker I kind of enjoy. But but I, th- I think we just have to recognize that they're just the biggest denizens of what is really a Serengeti on our skin, and that we need better ways to a- acknowledge that this living world that's on us is also part of us, and that that it's inescapable. And sort of the standard medical approach to thinking about the body has made us think of all these creatures as as a ooky or problematic or dangerous. And the, tr- the truth is far more complex. Well, let's talk a little bit about that Serengeti on our skin. We, we, we've become accustomed to talking about the microbial ecology of our intestinal systems although most people use some kind of shorthand that says microbiome, which technically just refers to all of the DNA data from all those microbial organisms. But we also have to acknowledge that our skin has also its own ecology. What do we know about that? It's interesting. So we've actually known about the skin's ecology uh, since the early 1900s, uh, what the first research was done. And it's, it's just kind of been a backwater. In the 1950s and 60s, people started to survey the human body, the skin, sort of in its entirety to make kind of a map of who lived where. And unlike the gut, most of the species that live on the skin can be grown in the laboratory. We know how to feed them. And, and so we can study them in, in ways that are impossible for some of the gut microbes. And what all that research has shown, and, and research since then, you know, the last 10 years have been this boon year for the study of microbes all over the body, is, is that every, every person is covered in a, in a pretty thick layer of these living microbes. They're, I mean, the way to picture them is to picture your skin as more like a mountain range than a smooth surface. And it has these valleys and peaks. And in those, va- those valleys are just full of microbes. And some of those microbes are just sort of established there, but many of them, the body is actually actively feeding uh, via glands because the body wants them there. And, and so this covers you, every bit of your skin is, is covered in microbes. And depending where you are on the body, you find different microbial species. And, and so on the feet, for example, you find Bacillus satilis, which is a it's one of the species that contributes to foot odor, uh, but probably also has some beneficial effects because we know it produces antibiotics that can kill fungi. 
And, and so one of the thoughts is that that bacteria species has actually historically helped people when they were walking through the forest barefoot, they were prone to fungal infection if their feet had cuts. And, and uh, having this good bacteria on their feet helped them to prevent those sorts of infections. And so different things are happening all over the body, but everywhere it's a layer of, of life. And so you have bacteria, you have archaeans, which are also single-celled, but this really divergent uh, lineage of life that we most often think of as finding in hot springs. Well, you can find them in hot springs or your armpits. There are nematodes in the skin. And then there are many, many, many viruses of the bacteria uh, that live on the skin. And so these are bacteriophages. They're even smaller than the bacteria. And th they attack the bacteria. And so all of these interactions are happening all the time. Many of these species can move. And so they're swimming around across your skin. And, and so it's really a dynamic place. And to me, for complex reasons, we, this idea is, I think, very off-putting to people. But the more I've studied it, the more it convinces me of our grandeur. That it's sort of like, you know, when we didn't understand the stars, they were beautiful, but not yet sublime. But as we came to understand the true scale of the universe, there was this wonder that, that now strikes us every time we look up when we have a quiet moment. And to me, we can find that same wonder with our own bodies, that, that we have this numerous, numinous ecosystem all over our bodies doing different things in different places that's largely beneficial to us. Well, I, I'd like to talk about what happens when things go south, so to speak, when that ecological balance is disturbed, either because of what we put on our skin or what we put in our bodies, antibiotics that may disturb not just the ecology of our digestive tract, but perhaps also the ecology of our skin. Uh, we're going to take a short break, but um, Dr. Dunn, when we come back, I want to talk about things like rosacea and blepharitis and why those mites on our skin might be causing some mischief and, and perhaps how we can get back into some kind of ecological balance. You are listening to Dr. Rob Dunn, the William Neal Reynolds Distinguished Professor in the Department of Applied Ecology at North Carolina State University and Visiting Professor in the Center for Evolutionary Hologenomics at the University of Copenhagen. His most recent books are Delicious, the Evolution of Flavor and How It Made Us Human, co-authored with Monica Sanchez, and A Natural History of the Future, What the Laws of Biology Tell Us. After the break, do mites on our skin contribute to rosacea and blepharitis? What happens if we take medicine to knock them down? We'll also discuss the ecology of our armpits. What do we know about the inhabitants? What do we still need to discover? How do antiperspirants affect this ecology? What happens when we stop using it? We'll also discuss how scientists study things that are so small. You're listening to The People's Pharmacy with Joe and Terry Graydon. This podcast is made possible in part by Cocovia, maker of the most proven and concentrated flavanol extract in the market today, CocoPro Coco Extract. With the proven power of cocoflavanols, Cocovia supplements support blood flow from head to toe. This National Physical Fitness and Sports Month, Give your heart and brain 100% and support a healthy you with the most proven flavanol bioactive. Get 20% off your Cocovia order from May 8th through May 22nd using the discount code FITNESSPOD at Cocovia.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Welcome. 
Welcome back to The People's Pharmacy. I'm Terry Graydon. And I'm Joe Graydon. The People's Pharmacy is brought to you in part by Cocovia, the maker of high-potency cocoflavanol supplements that support cognitive and cardiovascular health. More information at coco, C-O-C-O-A, via Com. And by Gaia Herbs, providing transparency through its Meet Your Herbs platform, tracing the origin of each product. More information at Gaia Herbs, G-A-I-A Herbs dot com. What do you know about the animals that live on your face or the bacteria that thrive in your armpits? They maintain an ecological balance and most of the time we're totally unaware of their presence. To learn more about these critters, we're talking with one of the world's foremost experts. Dr. Rob Dunn is the William Neal Reynolds Distinguished Professor in the Department of Applied Ecology at North Carolina State University and Visiting Professor at the Center for Evolutionary Hologenomics at the University of Copenhagen. His books include The Wildlife of Our Bodies, Predators, Parasites, and Partners That Shape Who We Are Today, and The Recent Delicious, The Evolution of Flavor and How It Made Us Human, co-authored with Monica Sanchez. So, Dr. Dunn, I set you up. Uh, Mites on the skin, in particular on the face, how do they in some way contribute to rosacea, acne rosacea is sometimes called, or blepharitis? And what is it and why is it and what can we do about these things? Yes. So, so that's a great question. It has this dissatisfying feature, that, like many questions about the skin microbiome that we don't fully know, that we're still learning. But one of the things that uh, has been seen in a medical context is that people with rosacea and people with an, a couple of other inflammatory skin disorders seem to have more of these mites on their faces or the mites are more conspicuous. They're easier to sample. And it's not totally clear if if they're all coming out of the follicles and uh, that are more apparent when we go to look for them, or if they're actually more more numerous, and and so one of the there are a couple of possibilities about what's happening there. One is that the mites combined with some bacteria species in the mites' guts that the mites are actually making more common on the face are triggering a um, sort of an overreactive immune response. And that that's associated with a, a number of these inflammatory skin disorders. I'd say it's, it's not totally clear, you know, why this is, why this happens sometimes and not other times and why it seems to be, be seems to be becoming more common. One possibility is that we're actually seeing different lineages of mites than we used to historically. And, and so if, if we look around the, the globe, what we find is in general that different human populations have different lineages of mites. As those human populations have separated over um, the last couple hundred thousand years, their mites separated with them. And so there's a sort of a potentially a fine tuning of the mites biology to the humans biology. But if we look today, there are a couple of lineages of these mites, not species, but individual families, let's call them, that have spread around the world. And so one possibility is that some of these mites that have spread around the world are not as fine-tuned to their human hosts, and so are triggering some immune responses that, that weren't seen historically. And so this is possible. We can't exclude it yet. It may be part of the story. Another possibility, and... I think this is part of the story, uh, regardless of whether it's the whole story, is that as we scrub our faces and clean our faces, if we do that enough, we eventually start to to wear down the carpet-like layer of beneficial microbes on our skin. And in general, in our sort of human ecology, when we wear down these beneficial microbes, what often replaces them is very weedy microbes that grow really, really quickly. They are often not beneficial, and they're often not very tough. They're not very competitive, except that they're they're able to grow very quickly. And so the gut version of this would be C. diff. Mm -hmm. C. diff in the gut doesn't, it's not a good competitor, but if you use antibiotics over and over again, it has a chance to establish. And if you use antibiotics to get rid of it, it still keeps growing back more quickly. 
And so it's, it seems like it's possible that something similar is also happening on the skin. Um, if you use lots of, of skin treatments that are killing microbes in the face, you use skin, skin um, topically applied antibiotics, that, that you're sort of clearing away some of these microbes that would normally be there. And you're making it easier for some of these weird, fast-growing microbes to establish. And those can include some of the microbes that the face mites have on board and are moving around. And, and, and so it, whatever's happening there is a, a complex um, sort of ecological, you know, in the gut we would call the dysbiosis. And we don't quite have a full version of the picture, but something has gone wrong with the system. And so I think the... Uh, Joe, you were asking about, you know, what can we do? And one of the things that for sure is beneficial, it might not cure these cases, but it, well, I'll, I'll step back. In, in the long run, if you want to prevent this from happening, one thing that would for sure be beneficial is to reduce your use of antibiotics on your skin, to reduce some of the, the use of products that are likely to kill off your beneficial skin microbes, because that predisposes you to some of these conditions. One of the tricks here is if you do have rosacea, one of the things people will prescribe for you are, uh, is more antibiotics. And that's a lot like this C. diff situation where it may cause a short-term benefit, but my suspicion and the, the early indications from the literature is it's also going to predispose you to getting in this loop where you can't get rid of these fast-growing bacteria that are somehow part of the story. And that might mean that even though you've used a course or two courses or three courses of uh, some antibacterial, antimicrobial medication that uh, was prescribed for your rosacea, perhaps the rosacea isn't just going to clear up. Th that's right. You may be, you may have a short-term benefit, but it may be putting you in this cycle where it's predisposing you to future rosacea again and again, because you've now created this situation where you have a blank slate on your skin and who's going to fill in that blank slate. It, it's not the slow growing sort of normal bacteria you, you would expect. And we actually understand this. Ironically, we understand this a little bit better for the armpits than we do for the face. If we want to go to the armpit version of this question, or, or we, we could stay away from the armpits. You know, it's, no, no, we, we definitely want to go to the armpit. Tell us what we know about it. Or don't know. Well, so in the armpits, we have this kind of gland called the apocrine gland, and it's often described as a sweat gland. But that's really a misnomer because what it produces is not sweat. It's a special kind of fluid that, that very clearly evolved so as to feed microbes in the armpit, also in the perianal region, also in the vaginal region. And these glands exist for no other reason. They're, they're microbe feeders. And in non-humans, we know that what happens with these glands is the glands feed specific microbes that are very slow growing, kind of an old growth forest of the armpit. And they slowly grow. And as they feed on that food, they metabolize the food and they produce the odors associated with armpits. And in gorillas and chimps, those odors are used by individuals to recognize each other. They're viewed in some cases by, by the individual gorillas as sexy or not sexy, so they're signaling. And the hair in the armpit is actually different from the hair on the rest of the body. It's, it's hair that's sort of specially adapted to wick out these smells so they can be detected. And so that's sort of the evolutionary uh, story of the armpit. And again, it's one of these things that's really not studied very much because it's not really medical and it's not, you know, in the Galapagos, and there's, there's nobody left to study it. But one of the things we became interested in, um, along with Julie Horvath-Roth at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, is to what extent do all these things that we do in our daily lives alter which microbes are growing in the armpit, and how should we think about that change? And we first started to do this research because, along with Julie, we, we studied the armpit microbes of chimps and gorillas and a couple of species of monkeys. And one of the things that we saw is that the chimps and gorillas had armpits that were dominated by crinobacteria, which are the bacteria that make those armpit smells. But if you looked at humans, some humans had tons of these crinobacteria, and some humans were dominated by staphylococcus, which people think is sort of the medically normal skin microbe, which is not actually true, but that's our sort of standard story. 
And so we then had this mystery, what was happening with humans that was different? You know, is it just that we're, we're more hairless? Is it something else? And so we did another study where we had people apply antiperspirant um, or apply deodorant or remove deodorant or remove antiperspirant if they were using it. And what we saw is that if you applied antiperspirant or deodorant, especially antiperspirant, that you were killing off these old growth microbes from the armpit. And so they were disappearing. And if you took away antiperspirant or deodorant, you were eventually favoring those old growth stinky microbes and you looked more like a gorilla or a chimp. And so if we step back, this sort of daily, um, you know, thing we do to our armpits or most people do their armpits is having this really enormous change on which microbes are on the skin and not only in the armpit, but actually sort of moving away from the armpit. And so this is the kind of thing that's happening on our skin in general, but that just happens to be the place that we've, we've studied it. And if you look at which species are favored by antiperspirants and deodorants, because it, they don't create a lifeless skin system, they just change which species are there, it tends to be some really unusual fast-growing species that my guess is are not terribly um, beneficial. And they, for example, include a species that produces an aroma that we find less offensive today in Western uh, societies, but it's much more attractive to mosquitoes. Oh. And so there's this complex interplay between what our body is trying to do, what we're trying to do with our, our daily uh, skin care, and our relationship to all these species. So if we stopped using antiperspirant, we might stop being quite so yummy uh, smelling to mosquitoes. That's right. But it then becomes tricky because I think in you know, Western U.S. society today, we would also be less yummy um, probably to people <laughs> to we would people. want to date. You know, and so there's some <laughs> yeah. trade-offs. Well, you know, Dr. Dunn, I've, I've heard, and I don't know if this is true, that if you stop using your aluminum-based antiperspirant, which, of course, the FDA requires, all antiperspirants must contain, by definition, aluminum, aluminum chloride, aluminum chlorohydrate, and aluminum salt, that you get a rebound odor that's quite unpleasant because now you are repopulating your armpit with all kinds of other stuff that uh, may smell. So, so we, we've heard reports of this when we did this study. We didn't see it in, in the small number of people that, that we work with in the, in the study, but it's entirely possible that, that, that this is happening because what you've essentially done is, you know, it's like you cut down a forest and you let a bunch of weeds grow and now you want the forest to grow back, but the weeds enjoy being there. And so we, as ecologists, we call those sort of alternative stable states. And so you may have created a new alternative stable state where you have some pretty funky microbes that give you a funky smell without historic precedent. I think the other thing to note there too is that most studies of skin microbiomes for the last 40 years are of uh, college age people uh, in the US and Europe and disproportionately white college students. And so that's really biased what we know about the standard skin microbiome. And just in the last couple of years, there have been a number of studies that have begun to study populations from other parts of the world. And, and as, as that's happened, one of the things we're starting to see is that from societies that are non-agricultural, often the skin microbiome is very, very different. And so, for example, there was um, one Yanomami t teenager, if, if memory serves, um, from an indigenous group in the Amazon um, whose skin microbiome was studied. And that individual teenager had more uh, kinds of microbes on their skin than at that point we had so far documented from all the studies we'd done from a thousand people in the U.S. And so the other possibility here is that what we're working with today when we study people's skin is very different from what would have been there historically. And so we don't yet um, have the right lens to, to see uh, that broader perspective. Um, and for me, that's one of the most exciting parts of science is that as you broaden your lens, as you change how you look at something, you keep finding these discoveries. From a medical side of things, it's also the most frustrating part of science that each time we round a corner, our uh, our perspective changes. 
Now, Dr. Dunn, how do scientists study something that it's so small you can't see it? Like those face mites. Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, so for the, the face mites, we can look at them under a microscope. And um, th- there are a number of, of uh, high school classes around the U.S. that do this. We actually have a module if you want to do this in your in your classroom. So you, so you can see them at sort of reasonably low ma- magnification, like what you might find in a school. And so that's one way to study them. But in truth, we're not very good at keeping them alive off of the skin. And so mostly what we can do when we get them in a microscope slide is sort of watch them for a little bit and, and marvel at their ability to move around, marvel at their, um, you know, we've seen them give birth. And so that's not so much how we, we study them as it is just how we engage at their scale. Far more often now what we do, and this is what we've done with uh, Michelle Troutwine at the California Academy of Sciences, is we actually look for the DNA of the mites. And we can do that two ways. First, we can actually find the mites and we, we can grind them up. It doesn't take much grinding. Uh, and find their DNA, DNA, make copies of their DNA. And use that DNA to compare one mite to another mite to figure out, well, how, how different is a dog mite from a human mite? How different is a chimp mite, mite from a human mite? But we, we also, if we just take a scraping of the skin, uh, even if we don't find the mites, the mite DNA is just sort of all over on your skin. And so we can actually identify whether there are mites there in some aspects of their biology that way. And then there's one group recently who's been able to piece the bits and pieces of the mite DNA together to, to uh, construct a whole mite genome. And that's really just in the last uh, six months. That's a big breakthrough because we can start to compare the individual genes of the mites and what they might do and how they compare to those of other animals and to figure out, well, which, which genes do they have? Which genes are they lacking? What does that say about what they might eat? But the, to me, one of the really humbling things, though, about what, how we study them is how we don't study them. And it turns out that in the 1950s and 60s, that some mite biologists were able to grow these mites and get them to reproduce in the lab on chicken skin. And we have spent hundreds of hours trying to repeat their experiments, and we've not been able to get it to work. And so we've lost the technique. And those biologists are not around anymore to help us figure out, you know, how we would do that. And is the chicken skin different? Are we different? Are the mites different? We, we don't know. And so, you know, if we could figure out how to grow them again, we could do all kinds of studies that are impossible right now. But we're not there yet. You're listening to Dr. Rob Dunn, an ecologist and evolutionary biologist focusing on the biodiversity of humans. He's the William Neal Reynolds Distinguished Professor in the Department of Applied Ecology at North Carolina State University. After the break, we'll talk about lots of little critters, dust mites, lice, chiggers, bed bugs, and scabies mites. How can we use information about their ecology to help us deal with them, as well as unpleasant realities like body odor and acne? Dr. Dunn describes an ancient Viking recipe for skin infections. Does it work? We share a story about milk of magnesia for acne. What would you say if you were to talk to your microbiome? You're listening to The People's Pharmacy with Joe and Terry Graydon. This podcast is made possible in part by Gaia Herbs. For more than 30 years, Gaia Herbs has nurtured the connection between people and plants to deliver nature's vitality. Their full-spectrum formulas are designed to provide an herb's complete array of beneficial compounds with nothing artificial to get in the way. Learn more at GaiaHerbs.com. That's G-A-I-A Herbs. Welcome back to The People's Pharmacy. I'm Terry Graydon. And I'm Joe Graydon. The People's Pharmacy is brought to you in part by Cocovia, offering its cardio health product with 500 milligrams of cocoflavanols in powder and capsule form. 
More information at cocovia.com. And by Gaia Herbs. Their formulas are designed to provide an herb's complete array of beneficial compounds with nothing artificial. More information at Gaia Herbs, G-A-I-A Herbs.com. Today on The People's Pharmacy, we're exploring the ecology of our skin. We're talking with Dr. Rob Dunn, an ecologist and evolutionary biologist focusing on the biodiversity of humans. He's the William Neal Reynolds Distinguished Professor in the Department of Applied Ecology at North Carolina State University and visiting professor in the Center for Evolutionary Hologenomics at the University of Copenhagen. So, Dr. Dunn, there are all these microscopic organisms, and they go way beyond the mites that you've been talking about. They include things like dust mites that are in our bedclothes and our pillows that may increase our our risk of developing allergies and, and breathing problems like asthma. And then there are lice on our heads causing terrible itching and chiggers and bed bugs and scabies mites. And, and then there are things living on our belly buttons that are, we haven't even gotten into yet. And so I guess my question is, you know, how, how can we, use this information that you've been gathering over the many years of your research so that so that people can deal with things like body odor and things like lice. I mean, we've got so many home remedies that I know the dermatologists just scream when they hear about it, you know, putting <laughs> milk of magnesia on your face to treat things like like rosacea or even acne. And speaking of acne, it too has its own apparent ecology. There are bacteria on our faces, and for decades, doctors prescribed oral antibiotics to wipe out the acne, and teenagers literally took antibiotics not for weeks, months, but for years. And so there's this this challenge. What do we do about all of the ecology that are causing all of these problems, whether it's lice or whether it's acne or whether it's rosacea. All those antibiotics might be one reason that that Yanomami teenager had so much more biodiversity in his uh, skin microbiome. And less acne. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a great question. I mean, I think maybe I'll quickly introduce an analogy. Um, And the analogy is the roach bait the cockroach bait that you put out in your house mm-hmm. and cockroach bait. So his, I mean, historically one of the ways pe- people dealt with insects in their houses is they sprayed insects, insecticide everywhere. And what that did was it favored resistance among any species that were, were left over. And so you were basically were creating this army of resistant insects all around your house. And the roach bait was this amazing little invention that attracted roaches into these little devices where they ingested the insecticide. And it wasn't a panacea, and some roaches have now evolved resistance to the roach bait in ways that are really interesting and topic for another day. But they were a way in which we could target um, the use of that biocide so that we weren't spraying it everywhere, and it was really targeting a particular organism we wanted to get rid of. And, and so I think w- one of the things we need to, to figure out how to do is to target our treatments uh, in a way that's much more fine-tuned. And so if we're thinking about antibiotics, you know, most of the antibiotics we use in the skin are really broad spectrum. In most cases, those antibiotics are going to kill whatever organism you're trying to get rid of and everything else that's there. And and so on the antibiotic side, you know, one of the things we need to be doing as researchers and clinicians is thinking about how do we work toward, um, let's call them antimicrobials in the broader sense, that are really targeting the specific organisms that we want to get rid of in those specific contexts in which they're causing problems. And so that's one of the kinds of things that we can do, more targeted treatments, not using a hammer on the whole ecosystem but, but going in to particularly find what it is we're trying to get rid of. And, you know, treatment of MRSA, methylacillin resistant staphylococcus aureus is a good example here. 
that, you know, if we had a, an antibiotic, um, and there are some in, in clinical trials that, that just targeted MRSA and didn't target all those other microbes around, around the MRSA, it, it would actually very likely make clearing up the MRSA more effective because you would then be having the other microbes help you to outcompete the MRSA. And so th that's, that's one layer of this. I think another layer is that this, I won't vouch for any particular remedy, but being more creative and thinking about how do we manage this ecosystem? How do we favor beneficial species? Um, how do we recognize that the skin microbiome can help us to, to fight some of these problems if we enable it? Uh, and in some cases, we're just going to need a lot more research to figure our way forward. In some cases, old remedies uh, can be quite helpful. Um, I talked to a researcher uh, in the UK not too long ago who had found an old Viking re recipe uh, that was a very effective antimicrobial on, for skin infections and a few, it appears to have um, very little evidence of the evolution of resistance. And so there's a Viking remedy that could be useful today and people are working on it. <laughs> That's so cool. Can you tell us just a little bit more about that? Um, I'm going to get to the, the limits of what I remember about the case, <laughs> uh, but it was, a, it, it was an old recipe that was described for um, eye infections, and it was discounted by historians, you know, as just another, you know, Viking, a little bit of Viking magic that was nothing oh, more those than old magic. Wives. Yeah. <laughs> and, and a particular uh, historian thought, well, this, this could actually be interesting and had heard somebody else talking about antibiotic resistance and wondered, you know, if we could make this recipe again, would it be effective? And that researcher was able to show along with a, the, the historian teamed up with a, a clinician and they were able to show together that in fact, the recipe worked. And that was the first study. And the second study, they were able to show that the recipe worked against uh, some skin infections that were hard to treat in other ways. And so here the Vikings rise from from their graves to to offer us some insight from your. That, that is very, very cool. Well, you know, what I find fascinating is that we tracked down an article in one of the prestigious dermatology journals. Someone wrote in and said, you know, I put milk of magnesia, which is, you know, a liquid laxative, on my face for acne. And wow, it worked so well. This is like 30 or 40 years ago. At least 40. And I don't think there has ever been another study. I mean, it no, wasn't they, even this a study. Wasn't a it was study. a case. Yeah. And it's like dermatologists go, uh, that sounds like an old wives tale. Uh, why would we want to study milk of magnesia when we have all these, you know, fancy antibiotics? And, and it just seems sort of sad that we haven't explored some of these, perhaps we'll call them alternative remedies. I, I remember a, 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 a person who worked with costumes on, I don't know, was it Broadway? And, and she said, what we use when we, you know, when we get the clothes after a performance and we can't wash them all, we spray the armpits with vodka. Right, so that the next person can wear it. Oh, fascinating! Without without feeling like they already stink before they begin. So there may be all kinds of interesting things. I before we finish this conversation, do you have any recommendations for people who are dealing with things like lice, for example, or other kinds of mites? Again, um, an old wives' tale. Some health professionals have said, well, when when kids have lice. And none of the lice shampoo are working. What we do is we put Listerine, old-fashioned yellow, amber Listerine, uh, work in into their scalp. And it apparently suffocates the lice and they aren't resistant to Listerine. Yet. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I, I, I don't have any... Um... Well, maybe t t two, two remarks here. One is that we've started to work a lot with food in my lab, and so fermented foods in particular. And one of the things we've seen with fermented foods is that no nobody studies fermented foods that are fermented in the home very much because they're not, they're not industrial foods. They're, not, they're often not very dangerous, and so they're not anybody's terrain. And, and as we've studied fermented foods, what we've seen is that bakers know so many things that the literature doesn't know about ways of creating <sighs> certain foods. 
And it reminds me of what you were just saying about, you know, what do we know about treating our own bodies? And I think there's a ton of, there's a wealth of knowledge out in our global community about ways to, to better cultivate a, a healthy body. And we need to be able to, to listen. We need to be able to, you know, and some, some of those remedies won't work and, and some will, but we only get to the ones that, that, that will through listening, through, through talking. And I mean, the milk of magnesia example made me wonder for, for a minute because, you know, when what our armpits are producing, when they feed those specific old growth microbes, it's a specific kind of food that favors those microbes. And so what if there are some treatments for rosacea that what they're actually doing is that they're pro providing food for some of those slower growing microbes to give them a, more of a chance to grow and outcompete the problem microbes? Uh, that's a totally plausible sort of mechanism that we could think about. And it, it's, it's not impossible that some of these, these home remedies or whatever the right term is are actually doing some of that and we don't know it. You know, and we won't ever know it unless we mm -hmm. pay attention and listen. Um, and and paying attention to that sort of thing, it's as you've pointed out, it it doesn't come into anybody's uh, bailiwick. Now, one of the things, as you're talking about what people eat, the how how we feed our microbes, one of the things that dermatologists have begun to pay attention to is actually the relationship between a Western diet that is high in highly processed carbohydrates and acne. Apparently, when we eat ultra-processed food, it um, feeds those bacteria that make pimples. Um, whereas if we're eating primarily um, very unprocessed foods, vegetables mostly, you know, in, in other parts of the world where they don't have access to convenience stores, people have less acne. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting one. I've, I've seen those studies too. And I think, I mean, part of what's happening is that the, you know, our bodies, so our conscious brains dislike all of these species that live in our skin, but our sub and in our guts, you know, we don't, we don't like the idea that we're in this vast consortium, but our subconscious bodies are in this constant communication with these species. And they're all allocating food to these species as a function of what is available. And as we change what we eat, we change what's available to our body and also change what our body is will, willing, in air quotes here, willing to provide to these other species. And so we know, for example, that if we eat a diet that doesn't have much nitrogen, that our guts will hold back nitrogen and won't feed it to the microbes in our gut microbiomes. They'll, they'll sort of alter the gut microbiome through what they release or don't release. And my suspicion is that in the skin, many of the same things are happening. But depending on what diet we're eating, our body is holding back food or releasing some food. And that's changing this whole ecosystem. And to me, what's fascinating is if we step back and think about all the ways that humans have lived over the past hundred thousand years, we've eaten many different things. And if, you know, the in, Inuit diet and the Amazonian diet were very different. But the reality is that our modern Western highly processed diet is like nothing that anybody has eaten over those 10 or a hundred thousand years, that it's just radically strange. And, and our, it causes our bodies to do things that uh, we're still just beginning to understand. So Dr. Rob Dunn, I'm wondering if the dermatological community is paying attention to your research, mites on our face, interesting organisms in our belly buttons, and what's growing in our armpits, because it could have a profound impact on the development of new treatments. I, I think the, the, the hopeful answer is that some people are. And, you know, what I what I saw looking back is that Ten years ago, if you talked to gastroenterologists about fecal transplants, you know, getting a good microbiome when yours has gone uh, wonky, people would laugh. Um, but gastroenterologists had all of these problems in patients they couldn't deal with, and now it's a common treatment. I think with, with dermatologists, we're seeing some of the same things, that there are all these problems dermatologists are trying to help people with where we don't have good solutions. And it, when you're in that moment, 
it makes people much more open to new ideas. And so I think there are exciting new conversations happening. And I'm, I'm hopeful about a more ecologically minded future of our skin. Sounds like we all need to adopt the royal we as an actual concept. <laughs> we, we do. And I'll just, I'll just close with a quick anecdote. That is, that we've, we've worked with people for almost two decades now on you know, trying to engender new conversations about our daily microbes. And I'm often not sure, you know, when we talk, when we tell people about their face mites or about their skin microbes, are they more likely to go home and, and do things that harm those species or do things that benefit them? But we engaged an artist, Joanna Risu, who collaborated with us, and she asked people in, in Times Square and elsewhere uh, to bend down and to talk to their belly button microbe biome to talk to their belly button microbes. And it was the most amazing thing because that gesture caused people to start these new conversations and to really think, well, what what would I say to these species that I live with more intimately than I live with my lover, than I live with my family? You know, what what, what should that conversation be? And so I invite everybody to bend over and talk to your belly button micro, microbiome and and think about what you would like to say and, and what you would like them to offer you back. Well, that sounds like a really, a really good plan. Dr. Rob Dunn, thank you so much for talking with us on the People's Pharmacy today. S such a pleasure, as always. You've been listening to Rob Dunn, an ecologist and evolutionary biologist focusing on the biodiversity of humans. He's the William Neal Reynolds Distinguished Professor in the Department of Applied Ecology at North Carolina State University and Senior Vice Provost for University Interdisciplinary Programs. Dr. Dunn also is affiliated with the Center for Evolutionary Hologenomics at the University of Copenhagen. Rob Dunn is the author of several books, including his latest delicious the evolution of flavor and how it made us human with monica sanchez and a natural history of the future what the laws of biology tell us lynn siegel produced today's show al wadarski engineered dave graden edits our interviews B.J. Lederman composed our theme music. This show is a co-production of North Carolina Public Radio, WUNC, with The People's Pharmacy. The People's Pharmacy is brought to you in part by Cocovia, maker of high-potency cocoflavanol supplements to support cognitive and cardiovascular health. More information at cocovia.com. And by Gaia Herbs. Their formulas are designed to provide an herb's complete array of beneficial compounds with nothing artificial. More information at GaiaHerbs.com. Today's show is number 1,320. You can find it online at peoplespharmacy.com, and that's where you can share your comments. Let us know what you think about today's show. Our interviews are available through your favorite podcast provider, this week, the podcast has extra information about the microbiome of your showerhead. You'll find the show on our website on Monday morning. At peoplespharmacy.com, you could sign up for our free online newsletter, and that way you can get the latest news about important health stories. By subscribing to our newsletter, you also have regular access to our weekly podcast and find out ahead of time which topics we'll be covering. In Durham, North Carolina, I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. Thanks so much for listening. Please join us again next week. Thank you for listening to the People's Pharmacy Podcast. It's an honor and a pleasure to bring you our award-winning program week in and week out. But producing and distributing this show as a free podcast takes time and costs money. If you like what we do and you'd like to help us continue to produce high-quality, independent healthcare journalism, please consider chipping in. All you have to do is go to peoplespharmacy.com slash donate. Whether it's just one time or a monthly donation, you can be part of the team that makes this show possible. Thank you for your continued loyalty and support. We couldn't make our show without you.